Well, good morning. Today, I've got a conversation I'm really looking forward to. Um, I'm welcoming Lauren Panrooker. Now, she is a photographer, cinematographer, producer, and business owner. So Lauren is uh, the owner of Tide Productions, and she kicked that off in 2014. Now, Lauren has gone on to win a number of national and international awards for her video work. Uh, and in her role as a producer, Lauren has worked with brands including Disney, BHP, TED Talk, and Hills Hoist, which I think is awesome. Uh, and now Lauren has a background in photography and her passion is for Tide to tell honest, engaging stories through beautiful, thoughtful content. Now, this is also my little bit where I think Lauren is an exceptional producer and she's an absolute legend. So, Lauren, welcome. It is so wonderful to have you here with me this morning. Thanks. I'm excited. Now, I, I know you're a little ne little bit nervous. Uh, you were telling me just, just before we went on, so we're just going to we're going to get that one out of the way first. Now, what I would like to do, and where I like to start, is I would like to talk about young Lauren. So, were you the sort of kid? that liked this sort of stuff at an early age? Were you into photography and stuff when you were just a whippersnapper? Oh, not really. Honestly, no. I was into acting hardcore. I was into like theatre and that kind of stuff, uh, but not photography. We didn't even have a film class or course in our school. Uh, so I didn't experience anything with a camera until I was at, at TAFE, like I studied a TAFE degree in performance and picked up a camera there just sort of as a little hobby and it kicked off from there. That's where I fell in love with it. So talk to me about performance. Oh, <laughs> it feels like it's two different people. Like I feel like I'm talking about a different person when I speak about it. But I was um, theatre class after school, uh, big into it, uh, desperately big dream to go to NIDA, become an actress, uh, studied theatre at South Bank Institute of Technology, which is now I think South Bank TAFE, right across the road from QCA. Um, and graduated from that, going to be an actress, going to be an actress, auditioned for everything I could get my hands on and got a role in a student short film uh, for some of the kids at QCA. One of my friends actually got the role. I didn't even audition for it. She got the role and something happened. She had to back out. She's like, can you, can you cover for me? I'm like, great, I did it. I got it, you know, I got a, got a role. And I saw the piece at the end and it was beautiful. I actually would really like to know who those students were. Uh, but, you know, so back then I didn't, didn't take any, any note of it. But the, the content at the end was so lovely. And I thought, these guys are students. If I could cut out the middleman, if I could stop all the auditioning and the failing to get the roles and that you don't look right, you're too tall, you, you know, all of this sort of stuff, and make my own work, I wouldn't, you know, I, I would take all the all the this stage that I can't seem to get over, I could, I could remove that. Uh, so I undenied about it for a really long time and I enrolled at the film school with the sole intention of networking to get roles as an actress and to learn how to make my own content, learn how to make my own, tell my own stories, write my own scripts, film my own short films and, you know, hopefully then go on to, to grander things. Um, it's all I did in first year, auditioned for everything, got every role because, of course, you know, hey, she's right there and she's keen. Uh, and then in second year I did cinematography course and it was just so fun it was I just loved I loved it so much then I acted in a bunch of the other people's films and I and I and I filmed my own and I remember just sitting there I don't remember even what the role was but I was I was sort of dressed in this gypsy outfit and I'm watching the camera team just thinking I just want to be on that side of it like I just want my scene to be over so that I can go and see what settings they're choosing and see what lens they've got. And and then and I just had this realisation that I was on the wrong side of the lens. Uh, and that was it. The the third year came around and everyone's, oh, you, you, you want to be in this one? You want to be in this? No, 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 I don't, I don't. Uh, and I'd, I'd won a couple of little awards in second year for some producer roles that I'd done. And so everybody wanted me to then produce. Oh, do you want to produce? No, 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 I want to direct. I want to, I want to be a director. So I turned down everybody, no acting, no producing, just directing. Uh, nobody trusted me to direct it. <laughs> so I ended up in these like scrappy roles for my grad slate, which if you haven't done film school, for some bizarre reason, grad slate is everything. If you if grad slate doesn't go well, you're dead. It's all over. Uh, which I have since learned is 
inaccurate. Uh, but that was it. You know, I didn't get the roles that I wanted. And, uh, and I just, I realized that I wanted to be on this side of the camera and I got the position of director for Will, which is uh, work integrated learning. So you get to work alongside a real client rather than, you know, sort of making a short film of your own, of your own dreams. And a lot of people poo poo Will, you know, corporate, sell out, terrible, you know, blah. And I loved it. I, I lost my mind over how much I loved it. Not only did the story that I got to tell have a platform once it was made to, to go out, ready to go, uh, but people saw it. So for every short film that I was involved in for grad slate or for every friend of mine who made a short film, for every short film that I made, you know, your mum and six of your closest friends watch it and then it goes on YouTube. Uh, and and I, I had this piece of content that the Minister for Health had seen and, you know, 16,000 of Queensland, you know, hospital staff had seen it. And I just, I realised that this is where I wanted to be. I wanted to be in communications, advertising, uh, and I wanted to be behind the camera more than in front of it. Uh, and so that was it. Then I sort of graduated and was like, well, everything I thought I knew is wrong. <laughs> what on earth do I do? Uh, and so I, I had a phone call from the, the woman who had been the client from the Will project. And she said to me, if you can get yourself together, get insured, get a baby in, ABN, uh, get an ABN and make yourself a little business. I'll get you to do some conferences and things that we have. Uh, panicked, lost my mind, stressed, couldn't figure it out, didn't know which way was up, called some friends of mine to like, you know, sort of wrangle this, this thing together. And a really good friend of mine, uh, Tish, was like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so I was director, she was producer, and we started what was then, it was called l, &L Film Productions. Uh, we did a couple of corporate gigs, we did some videos for cafes, we did some music videos, anything we could get our hands on. And on my business card said director, I was a director when somebody asked me what I did. But all of the tasks that I wanted to do, like I wanted to write the call sheets, I wanted to pick the crew, I wanted to, and I just, you know, again, I sort of had this realisation that I actually don't want to be a director as much as I want to be a producer. Um, so I, I, um, I bought l, &L in 2017. Um, Tish went on to America. We still stay in contact. She's incredible. Um, and I became producer of Tide Productions and sort of, you know, it took however long that was from 2014 to 2000. No, when did I start? Uni seven, two thousand seven or two thousand eight to two thousand fourteen for me to realize actually what I <laughs> wanted to do. Um, but I figured it out, and I love it every day of it. So that's pretty wild. And <laughs> I believe that I didn't know the acting story. <laughs> yeah, I don't tell that one. I don't tell that one super freely. <laughs> I'm delighted that we got that one out of you. Because I mean, I I really I want to go back a little bit here. And, oh, and I want to go back to that time in, in film school because that was, so, so was it, explain to me what the degree was. The film school degree? Yeah. Bachelor of Film and Screen Media from Griffith University. So the film school is a part of QCA. It's just a separated little building, um, beautiful little, beautiful little building. Um, but, you know, you sort of be part of the QCA cohort. So. Hmm. And you did that. And, and again, I'm just making sure I got my sequencing right here because you were trying to do the acting, but then you went into that as a secondary or you? So I graduated the acting degree, uh, spent six months trying to get work and then decided to enrol in the film school. So it was sort of one degree, pause, second degree straight, straight away, yeah. Gotcha. And see, uh, this this is amazing and so many things make sense here as I as I think. <laughs> um because I mean, like that, and and this is something that you and I have seen firsthand. Um, that acting world is brutal. Absolutely, it's insane. And I mean, to be able to stand in the stages that I dreamt of as a kid, in in a different role, still you still get that that awe and you still get that amazing feeling. So I remember the first time it was with you. We did. Oh goodness, what show was it? The ballet. The Italian or the Russian ballet that came to keep back? La Scala. La Scala. I don't know how I forgot that word. So La Scala was massive, this, this, this massive troupe of content that we had to create. And I walked backstage through QPAC, through the green room, through the backstage hallways, and then he sort of takes us out onto the stage. He's like, this is where the ballerinas will be, you know, very, very blasé. And I'd sort of, I'd come on and I was a little bit in charge of, of creating the content. So everybody was sort of looking to me and I just... So having this insane moment of like, I can't believe I, I've made it here. I've made it to the backstage of QPAC. 
but just in such a just a such a different way um but still just as much joy just as much you know some pride and and uh you know that that like I made it is that was a really nice it was a really nice moment QPAC was big I remember calling my mum you know I caught the train down because I just moved to Brisbane and caught the train in to to TAFE you know first couple of classes or whatever I said mum it's right next door it's next door to QPAC like I can audition for everything and you know, just <laughs> I, I think that that's just incredible, though, that you started in acting and obviously went through, you know, the the brutal nature of that. But yeah. then to find yourself, you know, looking at the camera teams and then somehow being drawn to that. Oh, I, yeah. I think... I mean, for me, it's every, and, and this isn't going to be for everyone, but for me it was every part of the expression, every part of the creativity, every part of the storytelling. It was all of that joy and all of that, you know, sort of outpouring of creativity. Um, but it didn't hinge on other people because I could tell it myself. You know, it did, I didn't require somebody in a plastic back chair to tell me that I was good enough to be in this short film um, or to tell me that I was good enough to be in this play or, you know, I, I was right, The you know, a really common one I got was it's good but I'm taller than the lead actor so I'm out, you know. Um, also potentially I wasn't very good, hard to say. <laughs> early on in my career but but you know every stage I hit came up against somebody else had to decide if I was allowed through that door um and filmmaking didn't have those doors for me uh because you know I just I was holding the camera so get out of my way <laughs> and I think potentially too because I embraced um the corporate client like an ally uh, I think I overcame a lot of boundaries that other people hit in advertising when they first emerged. Uh, you, you come out of, I came out of film school and the, the attitude was very much, you know, you want to make features or you want to make short films, you want to tell real stories. And, and advertising is, yeah, advertising is just a way to make money. It's a sellout. And I didn't feel that way at all. I love the ability to find out what the heart of a small business is or what a big business is and then display that in a way that resonates to an audience. And so I would sit down with the client and I would say, tell me all about it. Tell me everything so that I can tell the story properly. And I think a lot of other people or some other people maybe that those clients had encountered hadn't trusted them to be a part of it. It'd been like, well, I know how to make films, so you just be quiet, you know, silly corporate person with the money, get out of the way. Um, and so I think a lot of, those doors opened for me because I really welcomed them into the conversation and they enjoyed that. It's a fun process. Um, you know, so that's just maybe I'm making it stuff up. <laughs> I have seen this attitude a lot as well and in particular from people that have been through the traditional film school route where mm -hmm. there certainly is something there where the you know, they think advertising is the devil and, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're selling out doing that sort of work and they'd much rather, you know, go and make creative pieces of work to try and win, you know, go and, you know, on the road and showing their films and... Absolutely, Which, yeah. you know, I, I totally respect. Um, but one of the things that I think is often failed to grasp is the commercial reality that, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't make some money... Um, you're not going to be able to fund your little side projects as well. I mean, I also get a lot of joy out of the fact that people who make some of that content then need what we do to get audiences. So I've had, you know, we've we've had the opportunity to create some hype reels for feature films that have come to Australia or, you know, there'll be, for example, you and I often do opening nights. So there's this, the idea that that, that beautiful, you know, sort of pure expression of art then comes to us anyway <laughs> because they don't get to show what they do to anybody unless people know about it and the only way to know about it is what we do so it's a bit like i enjoy that <laughs> and i think that that's correct like that sharp storytelling and and you know making advertising as beautiful as you can like you still you know you're obviously trying to sell something but it it doesn't need to be you know free steak knives um, Absolutely style of advertising, mm -hmm. it can be beautiful. And I guess that's always stood at the heart of what I've believed. And I guess I'm interested to hear your, you know, a bit, uh, your thoughts around how that, that, that idea of just making it beautiful. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's about finding a group of creatives that have the same values that are as passionate 
because that's the environment where I can do my very best work. I think if you are surrounded by people who are as excited as you are about an idea, then those ideas start to flow and it becomes how can we make this better? How can we, you know, what what lighting angles can we do to make this more exciting? Or how can we break away from the mould while still following that sort of traditional, um, you know, system of storytelling? All of those sorts of things become exciting and, be, you know, become quite fun when you are in a group of people that all have that same idea. When you start, and, and I've done it a couple of times, work with people who just are not of the same mindset. And that's, that's fine. They go and work with people who have the same mindset as them. They might be much more serious. They might, you know, just want to get in and tell that story and get out again. I, I don't know. But, you know, I, I think you find your troop of people and, and you start to create with them and then you don't really let them go. Um, you know, I know I've got a pool of, you know, creatives that it's, you know, you hear an idea and you go, I know the team for that, no question. And you call them up and, yeah, that's just becomes about now, me. The best. You didn't know all these things when you got started, did you? This is, you know, you're you're speaking as a uh, as an experienced producer here. Yeah, I no. also, and again, you'll uh, you keep jumping forward here, but you know, I'm I just sorry. Like to come back. 2007, you you said to me you started. Um, well, LA. that's what I that's when I that, started my degree. I think oh, that can't okay. be right. I think I graduated in 2007, like school. So eight, nine, ten. So I graduated my TAFE degree in 2010. Sorry. That makes sense. What I really want to get to here is the start of l l Talk okay, to yeah. me about right. those early days in the business. And, you know, again, it's something that a lot of people experience, the, the complexities of pitching you, your skills, and trying to win that business. Absolutely. Uh, we had no idea what we were doing. I was really lucky that I had a colleague and friend who I could bounce all my ideas off. I work best collaboratively. I always have. So something as simple as writing an email uh, would be, you know, we would both sit down side by side, uh, you know, we would write that email together. I remember after about a year of business, we got a business mentor and he said to us, what roles do you do each? You know, do I assume you've split it up? I'm like, no. And he's like, okay, well, who does the invoicing? I'm like, both of us at the same time. And he's like, who writes the emails? Like, us. Like, we sit down at our desk next to one another. We do literally everything as a team. He was like, that is so impractical. <laughs> so, you know, just that idea that, that the way that we started was everything was together because, I mean, she may tell this story differently, but I had no idea at any point what I was doing. So having somebody next to me to go, does this sound right? Is this what we should do? Uh, there's a big, big, big part of it for me. Guessing, guessing our way through a lot of it. We made some mistakes. A lot of our clients were really forgiving. You know, we, we would come into every conversation. We never walked in pretending that we were the bee's knees. We never came into any situation going, we are the absolute best, you know, trust us and get out of the way. You know, our, 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 the atmosphere we tried to create was always collaborative and we would explain that we were new. Like we're, you know, we've been in business for this many years and this is why we want to tell this story. Um, I think potentially that's why we were forgiven for some of the mistakes that we made because people, you know, they knew that we were new and so they gave us another go. And, I mean, we, we also never made a mistake and went, oh, my goodness, so sorry, see you later. Like, we fixed it uh, the best way we could, whether it meant a reshoot, uh, you know, whether it meant doing another edit, starting, whatever it was. We The, the deal was we promised we'd tell you a story, uh, you know, and, and we'll do it until everybody's happy to an extent where it's reasonable. You know, we didn't really have anybody that tried to take us for a ride and the very few that we did, we dealt with as best we could, I think, you know. And I also note that you refer, yourself, refer to yourself as a photographer first. Yeah, I don't really, I don't really know how it got in that order. Um, I feel the most confident as a photographer which is weird because it's the only thing I'm not professionally trained in uh so I have degrees in everything else that I do but I don't have a degree in photography at all um but I think when you go onto the website um a lot of the photography is is mine uh opposed to you know some some creatives where we've done like big big jobs say for example large-scale commercials will get DOPs on board whereas um I'm holding a camera and I feel very, very safe. Um, so as a producer, I think I have a little bit of imposter syndrome still. 
uh, as a DOP, I certainly do. I am a cinematographer as far as I absolutely love it and I do it a lot, uh, but I've not won any awards for my cinematography and I still have a lot to learn, uh, you know, to be as good as some of the boys that I get to work with or some of the, the guys and girls that I get to work with. But photography for me has always been a little bit unapologetic. I think because I'm not trained in it, I'm a bit like, well, this is a photo I took and people seem to like them. So um I don't know. It, I don't know that that comes first deliberately. <laughs> it makes sense, though. It sounds like it's your most creative form of expression. Yeah, yeah. And I, people always, maybe, maybe because of the way a draft process works for content, people question the photography less. So you give them a photo and they go, it's beautiful, I love it. And you're like, wow, thanks. Whereas with a video, there's always something you can change. There's always something that needs to be updated. They've always just updated their logo. Their font's different. <laughs> You know, there's, there's this process where you have to sort of trudge through the through the thick of it to get to the final product and then you hand it over, uh, where it's very rare with a photograph that that same process happens. Usually you just go, here are the photos. And they're like, wow, <laughs> screw our fingers. <laughs> <It's done. laughs> and I look, I appreciate that as somebody who's untrained as well. Um, I, I think that part of the nice thing is that there's no rules, um, you know, when you don't have any professional training there's no there's no inbuilt mindset of what's what what's right and what's wrong and what's the correct way you just do stuff that you'd like and if it resonates with other people then that's good and i'm still learning so i unintentionally got a very specific style very specific color palette you know it's a, it's a look and feel that my photos have and my production manager she wanted to learn stills. I just upgraded my my kit. I just upgraded my camera. So I said to her, look, you take you take the 5D, which is which was my camera. You take the 5D back to Melbourne, that's where she's based, and do some shoots, play around, we'll book you some some beginner clients and, and you know you can get started in that. Um, oh wow, okay, you know, so she came up to Queensland and we did a little master class and she took some photographs. Um, of the little little set that we we'd set up, and then we put it into Lightroom, and I'm t I'm teaching her how to grade them, and I'm a little bit cocky. I'm like, oh, lighting up this way, this is how much it needs to be increased by this and this and this, and she's like, oh, I was going to do it a different way. I was like, oh, please take over. So I roll my chair out of the way, and she takes over, and they were beautiful. Absol would enter them in a competition. Beautiful. The lighting is nothing like what I would have done. It's darker but it's softer and it's got this mood to it that it just sings. These photos were, were amazing. So to her, they're so, so, so beautiful. Oh, thanks, you know, so fun to learn. And, and I just walked away from that going, you just got to deflate your head all the time because every opportunity to work with somebody, whether they're just starting out or whether they have been in the industry for 50 years, is an opportunity to learn and to become a little bit better at what you do. I think that's very valid. And, you know, I also love the fact that, you know, you've been through all these things and you do also get the opportunity to teach if you're happy to share a little bit about that. Oh, I love, yeah. So I'm a sessional staff member at, at Griffith Uni uh, and I love it. I teach, um, when, when I when I get the, the opportunity, I teach um, third year screen producing, which I love. I would very much like to rename the course how to get a job when you graduate because for me producing is a is a very specific role with very specific tasks uh, but it also encapsulates the idea of getting your content seen in a really in a really broad stroke so if you're a magnificent cinematographer how do you get your work seen by anybody whether that is to get a job at a production house whether that's to get a client to do some freelance work for if you're a sound designer like there's just I felt when I graduated, I didn't really understand the next step. And for me, that's what this class has become a catalyst for me to share. How do you step out of university? Um, because there are a thousand different ways that you can go. Certainly not instructing you which one to pick, but it's just understanding the best way to do that. Um, really simple skills like email writing. Do not ever, for any reason, ever write the sentence to whom it may concern. <laughs> Just don't do it. It's not a sentence you should ever write down. Find out who they are. I love the story. I actually tell the story of how you and I met, Scotty, because it's one of my favourites. I think I, oh, look, there's blurry bit. I think I looked you up. I don't remember how I came across you, but I remember thinking, these guys, these guys are on the money. They're 
content is sharp and beautiful. Their website is amazing. They are so, so, so cool. So I stalked, I Google stalked you. I found out all about you, who the owners of the company were, blah, blah, blah. And I emailed you, Scott, my name is Lauren. Your work is amazing. My favorite piece of yours. I think it was the matte art painting under the bridge. I think that's the one that I mentioned. It's magnificent. The artwork is beautiful, but the cinematography is next level. I would love to buy your coffee. Uh, I think potentially you were like, maybe one day, okay, nice stranger. Um, and I emailed you again, what are you doing? Where are you? Like, I know that your office is in West End. Can I come? What's your coffee order? Um, oh, well, I'm free, maybe next Wednesday. And it just rocked up. I just came, I bought a coffee from down the street, I think. And I just was so desperate to meet you. And then we sat down and we had a conversation and, and we just, we had the same opinions on a lot of stuff. Content should be beautiful. Content should be fun. There's no situation professionally where you would ever belittle anybody. Like, I mean, I don't know that we talked about that exactly, but you start to get to know somebody and you realize that you're on the same wavelength. Um, and I think we just, that's the kind of, there's a balance between stalking and initiative, but, but you know, you shouldn't just sit behind a desk writing to whom it may concern, I would love the opportunity to work with you, send, and then not hear anything and pull a sad face. Like, get out there, go to, go to events, you know, go to meet people that inspire you and force your way into their lives. <laughs> because, you know, that's just all this stuff. I don't know if you guys can see me, but like my most, most of my most proud projects are like framed on my wall and half of those are with you, Scotty. Like you just, you find your people. I And I think you're spot on there. And interestingly, that specific story is one that's come up a, a number of times in people <laughs> that I've chatted with recently where they've just seen a company that they wanted to work with and mate they just kept knocking until somebody let them in they're like hello hello absolutely hello. yeah <laughs> that that story actually keeps repeating um of how people basically just beat the door down until Honestly, they get let in I mean, it happens now. People email me, you know, hello, Lauren, I would like the opportunity. And then and you don't have anything on slate. And so you just write, thank you for your email. I'll, you know, I'll keep you in mind. And it's it sounds really rude, but you don't because you just forget. So then when a, when a project comes up and you need to crew it, they don't pop into your head unless they wrote something really, really memorable, which they almost never do. Uh, and so it's the person that then emails again. Oh, I'm just touching base. This is my latest piece of work. You know, I saw you posted the newest, whatever, you know, working with MG. That's so exciting. Like whatever it is that, because they're following me on social. And then I go, you know what? I actually need an assistant for this. Or I need a runner. Or, hey, you know, I've emailed people before being like, hey, your CV says all this stuff about graphic design. Do you actually do, you know, can you animate? Yes. Okay. I need an assistant animator. Like if, if you're, Emailing them at a relatively appropriate, you know, amount of, of, of intervals, then at one point you're going to email them when they're trying to think of somebody. Um, and I think most of the, the people that I've worked with in, in that capacity where they sort of come in as an intern or they come in as a, as a, a runner or an assistant and then they, you know, you work with them more and more and more. Um, working with a, a guy at the moment who did just that, you know, I taught him at Griffith and he emailed me a couple of times and he emailed me on the same day that I was crewing a project where my you know, assistant wasn't free. And I was like, all right, Jack, mate, come on board. I need you for two days. Are you free? And, and that was it. You know, we worked together like six times in the last two months. So, yeah. And I look, honestly, I think that that's awesome advice. And, you know, I've, I've actually brought on a number of people over the years that have like just cold um, emailed me and I actually had one yesterday, um, a fella that, you know, has obviously found, you know, what I do and shot me an email and said, oh, look, here's what I do. I've moved to Australia. Um, here's the work that I produce. And I had a look at some of the work and I'm like, that's pretty top notch. Um, but, you know, as you said, if you only send it once and then never follow it up, mm. you know, the 200 plus emails I get a day, you know, plus the messages, plus the phone calls, um, like, yeah, you, you genuinely miss stuff and you're not meaning to mm. be rude. Absolutely. Um, but also sometimes the people people are just dreaming um, and and you look at the work and you go, look, I don't think that that would fit. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, and I'm sure you're the same. I'm actually always happy to chat with people and say, hey, I'm, you know, you know, as long as you're a nice human. Yeah. Um, you know, you're happy to just talk to them and listen. And, and I, I've had the nice. interesting experience every now and again where I'll be in a social situation where I'll say, They'll be, oh, what do you do? And I say, oh, I, I run a little company called Tide. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of you. I'm like, 
no, I'm sorry, I don't think you, it's called Tide Productions, like the ocean, you know, huh? and they're like, I've heard of you. I'm like, how? And it turns out that, you know, they, you know, I heard about you in some great mind and they emailed you and the fact that you replied with a kind, you know, whether you work together or not, I think being a genuine person is a big part of it because there's a lot of I'm too busy um, that can be in the, in the, in the, in the, higher ups, I guess, I don't know how you phrase it, of this industry. Like once you get too busy, you're just too busy for any of that. And that that culture can sometimes uh, appear in agency. We do a lot of agency work and you'll find these people very like, oh, well, you're, you know, you're just a, a I guess, a labourer in a way. You know, you're a camera operator. You're wielding my dream. Um, and so we don't genuinely work too many times with those, those kinds of agencies because the culture that we create is collaborative, you know. We want to work together. And if there's a problem, we solve it together. And we're polite to each other if something goes wrong. How do we solve this? You know, what's the best foot forward to make sure that the client is still satisfied? Because sometimes mistakes, they happen. Um, and you, more than anybody else that I've ever worked with, were was my role model for how to set that up. Because I never experienced in all of my time at TPR, I mean, if it's not clear in this podcast yet, yeah, we work together a lot. All of my time in TPR, there was never a situation where there was a mistake made and you threw it at my feet and went, fix this. Um, it was always come together. How do we solve this? You know, if it was a meeting, if it was a conversation, if it was an email, it was a team effort straight away. And there was never this like stress around the fact that I had made the error. It was like the error has been made. <laughs> it's it, The problem has happened. How do we move forward? And it was that for me was like, that is exactly how I want to be as a leader. That's exactly the kind of culture that I want to invest in. Is, is Well, nothing good comes from that. And I guess my background was that, you know, I worked in, you know, big corporate and, you know, nine times out of 10, you were being yelled at for something um, and generally something you weren't responsible for, but they just needed someone to yell at. Um, and, I was always disgusted at that sort of behaviour because not only did it not fix the problem, it made me not want to try. Yeah. And, you know, and you just end up going, well, whatever, mate. Um, mm. And, and I, you know, that being my lived experience, I, I sort of thought, you know, why on earth would you do that to people? Mm. You know, why would you cause them that sort of trauma? And, you know, sure, you might get a short-term fix, but, you know, that person is not going to stay around. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But look, I think it's also worth um, uh, dancing in here because when you, when you and I met, and I, I, I do think that this is worth um, discussing, I, I thought it was actually very serendipitous um, because, you know, we had similar but opposite problems where we had, you know, no film experience we had no access into the film world and we were just a bunch of cowboys just making stuff our way um because i just you know i didn't know what the right way was and you know uh, my main man phil he also self-taught didn't know you know um and and we're just like that's cool we should do that and <laughs> You know, if we can make it awesome, then that's even better. But what we didn't know is much the same as the two of you sitting down and, you know, sending your emails and invoices together. We didn't know how to, like, crew stuff or how to be bigger than, like, just the two of us. Um, and we actually needed somebody with your skills and expertise to actually help us to grow. And I don't think that we would have had the opportunity to do the big things that we've gone on to do if we hadn't have met you. <laughs> well, that's nice. <laughs> so that's pretty wild um, because this is, I, I'd really like for you to share, I guess, the experience from your side because we've, we've done some pretty cool things together. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I, I, your experience as a producer and before we dance too far down here, how would you explain a producer to somebody? I heard a really beautiful explanation for a music producer once that I think resonates with how I see my role, which was a producer holds, oh, what did he say? It's from my very favourite documentary, um, which is Sound City. Uh, he says a producer 
holds a, a glass over the bat phone or something. Basically what he's saying is he creates an environment where the creatives get to do all of their magic and he protects them from the outside world while they make it. And then he sort of takes the lid off and he reveals it. So I think um, one part of my job that I absolutely love is the collection of crew together, choosing the right people for this job. That's, I, I think, a really big part of my role is um, so the client will come in and say, this is what I need. And I go, visually, I understand what that person, you know, what what who, who could do that the best. And, and to create that kind of soundscape, we need this person. And they also organize the budget in a priority. So do you spend all of your money on visuals or do you know i've done projects before where you have a very small budget allocated for camera and camera crew then this massive budget for sound because there's this beautiful intense soundscape but the, the visual is quite simple um and that's a really creative decision so i call myself a creative producer very specifically i'm not um here to just sort of sign your paperwork and then let you do whatever you want like i i'm a part of it um and the fact that i own the business gives me that opportunity to to dictate those rules which is kind of fun um but yeah i, I bring the team together that suits this project best and then i allocate what elements of the budget should go where to make sure that the delivery is exactly what the client wants so it's kind of like hearing what the dream is and then choosing all of the ingredients and then putting them in the right order so that the dish tastes right. Uh, and I think that role is sometimes overlooked because, I mean, often a, a director is involved in, you know, you know making the, the, the piece come together, but picking the director, you know, and, and making sure that the camera guy and the director work together well, like that's quite a, quite a fun part of what I do. And um, I would say conception to delivery is, is you know, what ties my role together. Um, to make sure that it, everything goes well. I think that that's a very good description. I actually like the description. Of, you know, I don't like to, <laughs> I like to to, it. No, but to allow them to do their very best because I, I think that that's important to, you know, put some framework around that. Um, as I ask you, what was it like to start directing commercials and shorts for uh, the Walt Disney Company and uh, their theatrical. Amazing. It was amazing. Um, often a lot of the opportunities I've had in my career have come, <laughs> a lot of the, the skill sets that I've learned have come because I can't afford for somebody else to do it, so I do it. Uh, you know, that's how I learned cinematography. I was like, well, I can't afford somebody else to do this, so I'm going to jump in and give it a red-hot go and do that enough times and eventually it starts to look all right. Um and I think directing, you know, you sort of, you heard my origin story about how I was desperate to be a director and realised producing was actually my calling. But sometimes what would happen is you would you would produce this thing to the, to the finest, finest detail. And then you would have to pay and choose a director to come and take over. Like that was for me every now and then for certain jobs, some jobs necessary. I knew that I wasn't the right person to tell their story. Um, but every now and then a job would come across your desk and you're like, I know every answer that they're going to ask a director and I know exactly what the client wants. And I, I feel, I really feel that I can do this. Um, so Drama Queens was one of those for me. You know, I had a line item there that said director and I was like, get out, <laughs> get out of the way. Let me do my job. Uh, and so we just wrote my name down next to both roles and, you know, you, you green lit me and, and that was it. I got to direct my very first, like, on air television commercial, um, which I was ecstatic about because the idea of, you know, going to the, the months of pre-prod meetings and watching the show a thousand times to figure out what angles every instrument should be shown at and then to decide what part of the song you'll be looking at what instrument, like to go into that kind of detail and then give that to a director for me was a bit like, no, nah, thanks though. <laughs> so, so, you know, we just, we did it. And again, when you've got a crew that, that you absolutely trust a lot of those potential problems they go away there was no part of me that was worried about the angles not coming together because i knew who i had on crew and and we had you have you develop this language with them uh you know make, make it sparkly is something that i say to phil a lot and he knows exactly what i mean it doesn't actually it has nothing to do with sparkles or angles like he just knows what i want when i say make it sparkly <laughs> um and i think you know there's a lot of joy in that in in being able to just use the language and talk to a team that's trusted and just just get in and and make the make the vision that you've got in your mind make that come to life 
it's really lovely i get and and hearing that language and that creatives working together because i think that's one of my favorite parts of the whole job is having people that are just extraordinary at their singular stream in this industry and i've always found that's where the magic happens when you've got just the most wonderful director producer grip gaff like all the way down the line you've got people that you look at and you go they are just in my yeah. opinion for this job the very 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 best we could have and then you just get out of the way yep yeah i often mm -hmm. uh, have a little joke saying that if i'm not doing anything on set it's because i've done my job right <laughs> Uh, so, you know, if you see a producer running around stressed out of their mind, something's gone wrong. Um, so if I'm sitting down watching the monitor, you know, if I'm lucky enough, I've got a cup of coffee in my hand, it just, that is a green tick. It's it's such a good feeling. Um, I do, I remember the the cacophony of monitors that we had at, at Frozen. Um, and we just, it was you and I and, you know, like a, like a wall of clients behind us and we're just sitting down watching, literally watching magic. Like that's how I felt. And, you know, Dean's off in the corner doing his thing and there's some like enormous jib arm towering over the top of us. It was, it was just a moment of, of we're here and we did it and it, we're just letting it play out. We're just letting it roll. Um, that was magic. The whole, the whole shoot. One of my favorite moments and probably most memorable moments of shooting and what we're talking about here is the, uh, uh, Lauren and I had the opportunity to, um, uh, produce the electronic press kit, which becomes a TV commercial for uh, Frozen, the theatrical production. And this was obviously very special um, for us because, you know, to get to do something at that level, you know, is terrifying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When I say, "Righto, you ragtag bunch of misfits, this is this is on you. Don't don't cock it up." Um, <laughs> I remember sitting outside stage door i was sitting on the ground with you guys as people were like bumping everything out and like just on the footpath absolutely <laughs> wrecked like wrecked physically mentally emotionally just broken oh. but knowing that what we'd pulled off was extraordinary yeah and i i vividly remember that specific moment of the day and the overwhelming relief that came with actually having done it. Oh uh, yeah. I think I ran, I re I remember I had a smart watch and I'd done like 17,000 steps that day or something. Like we talk about, you know, when, it, when you're sitting down doing nothing, you've done your job. Well, there's elements where you still have to run around. I ran from stage to our the hotel we were staying in like six times for a cacophony of different reasons like someone would need something and it's in in the in the kit at base and i would oh i'll just go get it <laughs> like flooring it down the main street of Sydney at full pace. like just just fun i think you, yeah when you know it's coming together and there weren't any dramatic emergencies they were all you know I can get, I can fix this. I can get this done or, or not even fix. I don't think is the right word. I can get that for you or I can solve that or I can make this task easier with this solution. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. It, and it is, it's very special. And I don't know if it's been a similar experience for you, but on the other side of something at that scale, I'm far less scared um, going into other projects. I certainly have a level of confidence now. <laughs> where I might not have had before. Um, but, you know, pulling off something like that. Do that you know what? I don't know that I have any less fear going into any role, but I find my clients are much easier to deal with because they have this unwavering trust in me, which I... I just get to enjoy the benefits of. I don't have anything to do with. So, for example, every time I do this a, a massive job, or if I if I am lucky enough to to win an award of some kind, that information goes out. And then, I mean, a, a very small example is I'm doing a photo shoot next week, which I'm really excited about. And um, the agency put together a, a brief packet for the client, and there's two full pages on why they chose me. And I'm sort of scrolling in my head, thinking they must have written this before they picked me and then just slotted photos of mine in. Like, I don't, and then I'm reading it. I'm like, no, this is really specific to my style. Like they've, 
they mentioned things that I've done and awards that they've won and, and they've picked photographs that perfectly represent the style that the client wanted. So I'm, I'm flicking through and thinking, oh, gee, it's lucky that I've got some photos that look like what the client wants. And I sort of just had this realisation that actually I think they may be picked to me because I create content that the, that the client wants. You know, so there's this, you know, I'm still going into this photo shoot next week petrified that, you know, any anything could happen and, and you've got that feeling of like why on earth would they pick me for this when there are other photographers out there that have been working for like 20 years but then you look at the brief packet that the client got originally and you look at my my work and you're like they actually they marry <laughs> so i didn't necessarily have anything to do with that confidence but like she literally emailed me and said are you available on the 20 on, on the i don't know if i should get to, on the 24th are you available and i went yes she was like fantastic i'm booking you in that was it. I didn't have to sell, you know, whereas, whereas a couple of years ago it was, hello, my name is this. Can you prove what you've done? Do you have any other examples? Do you have any testimonials? Can I meet you face to face? Like you have to vet every element of your business and professional personality. Um, sorry, business and personal personality. You know, are you going to gel with them? Are you polite? Are you punctual? Are you professional? Um, and then can you do the work? What camera do you have? Like The amount of times that I, I used to have in my emails a gear list because I would just copy and paste it when people said, can you explain what you use? Because they were vetting that I wasn't like, oh, I, you know, shoot on a Canon, you know, art of relation to, to shooting still. It's got a funny little flash up the top. I love it. Like they wanted to see that I had real gear. Um, and I just don't know when that stopped, but I think it had a lot to do with the, the, the projects. You know, people would see these and go, well, I don't have to ask because if she made this, she doesn't, she, she must know what she's doing, um, which is kind of nice, but I still, uh, I'm still very scared. <laughs> they just, they're not. <laughs> I hadn't realised that. And actually you verbalised something that I don't think I'd actually noticed is that, yeah, people don't ask that anymore, do they? No. Nah. Like, All that I, would, I would say in, a, in percentages, in the first two years of my career, I spent 70% of my time justifying that I could do the job. Um, by my fourth year, it was probably 40% of my time. And then the rest of it was in post getting it perfect. So I would, you know, spend a little bit of time justifying and then we would film it. And then post would be this, this, pro, this massive process. Uh, and just in the last couple of years, as we're, as we're just coming up, you know, nearly close to 10 years, um, as, as tight as getting that age, it, I'm finding it's, it's um, almost no time justifying. It's a little bit of time conceptualizing. So we get to you know, they don't come to us anymore and they say, we want this very specific thing. Can you do it? They come to us now and they say, we need to, uh, so an example, one that I'm working on at the moment that I'm really excited about is we want to show that our hot sauce is the best. Part of the reason I'm excited about this, this is because it is, Scotty, it is the best hot sauce I've ever tasted. Like I live for this stuff now. It is, we have like seven bottles in my fridge at home because it just is, you know, so, so to be able to work with something that you're like, I genuinely believe that this is the best hot sauce on the planet. How do we tell this story? And the only question I said to him, do you want to be funny or do you want to be serious? And he went, let's be funny. And that was the brief that I had was my hot sauce, let's be funny. And I got to make every other creative decision while well, we're in the process of making every other creative decision. And, you know, we, we have had a couple of meetings where the clients brought on some magnificent ideas that we're definitely taking on board. Um, and then we'll film, which will take a day, and then we'll edit, which will take a couple of days. But I know exactly what it's going to look like. And I feel like I can see a lot of the red flags that could pop up and I can stop them. You know, something as simple and easy as we're going to need a picture of the hot sauce for the end. <laughs> you know, you, you, I know a, a couple of years ago I would have gotten to post, sent them a draft, and then they would have been like, great, but how do we show the product? Oh, okay, and then you've got to get the sauce, and you've got to take a photo of it, and you've got to, you know, that we're going to do that on the day. <laughs> so you can you, you eliminate a lot of those little things that we sort of went through a lot while we were still getting our feet. And, and now the process itself has become about the idea and getting it to be what what I really hope will be like award worthy, um, and and that, and so that's the that's the triangle of, of of the creative process for us now, rather than you know what it was before, which was like prove it and then and then you get the opportunity to make it very quickly in this sort of small small span of time. Whereas now it's like the bulk of what we're doing is is the fun part. <laughs> it's a nice change, isn't it? Where 
Um, and, and you're helping me reflect on all this too is is the nice part is mm-hmm. that people really do. I, I get a phone call from somebody going, you do this. Can you just make the thing? Like what's mm-hmm. your idea? How would you do it? Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right. That's not something that would happen earlier. It was, they would come with know, pages of ideas that were already approved by corporate. Like, yeah, you would you would be vamping. You know, you would be yeah. you would be making something that already exists, you make it shiny. Uh, now we get to make it from scratch. Um, and I think the th- same thing can be said uh, as a as a producer rather than a producer at Tide. Um, you know, often sometimes I'll get calls and I'll be like, hey, can you come on this project as a, you know, I, I mean, as a producer um, and I'll go, oh, sure, you know, do you want me to send you some? No, no. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, when when I was lucky enough to work on Carlisle, I was um, suggested by by Tish, who I'd run l l with, um, to the to the director and, and he sort of called me up and he was like are you, are you free are you keen and I talked about the idea and I, I said to him give me give me a day or two to, to put together all of my I guess like my pr- proof of, of who I am you know let me show you everything I've ever made so that you can see if you like me and and I was ready to basically go on a job interview I was ready to go on a job interview for this role and he went no no, no you've got it I was like I'm sorry and he doesn't give you free, it's yours. The role is yours. Like Tish says you're you're on it, you're on it. And I was like, it's you <laughs> and you know, that was one of the first experiences of just, you know, he looked at my work. He somebody who he trusted very, very much had said that I could do it. And I I I, I did it. <laughs> and it was wonderful. It was one of the best jobs. And that one won an award as well, didn't it? Yeah, we won a couple actually. Um uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty wild and i mean out of some of the work that you've done i mean what's what's really stood out to you over the years what are the ones that have, have really made your heart sing oh motto motto i love motto motto was so fun that was the agency was fun the client was fun they said to us how do we make this dish how do we make this, this sandwich seem like the best most exciting sandwich in the whole world and we had these really creative uh sorry these these really silly problems that we had to overcome. So one of the silly problems was that we wanted to film in a beautiful restaurant and we had access to this very beautiful restaurant, but this very beautiful restaurant had its own branding everywhere. Of course it did because it's a restaurant, right? So there's like, it's the, this restaurant's um, what's it, like embossed things in the glass everywhere on the windows and it's on all the chairs and it's like, and the client was like, this is the kitchen you can use. And we're like, oh my gosh, it's flippity flop and beautiful. And they're like, don't you dare show that logo, not a single anywhere. And we're like, but logo is everywhere. <laughs> so like, we spent like an entire day in this room just trying to pick an angle of this of this this grill plate that didn't show a logo. Like that was, I just had so much fun because I felt really trusted. Um, we came up with the idea and, and, you know, I would sort of say, this is one way that we could tell this story. Oh, great, yeah. And I remember pitching two ideas and him saying, well, what, which is your favorite? And I was like, I have literally never been asked that before. I was like, without a doubt, it's this one. He was like, great. And he like picked the first one up and like threw it over. Like he was like, that's out of the way. If she likes this one, we'll do this one. And that that trust was was really exciting. Um, Carlisle, obviously massive highlight, so beautiful, such an incredible team um, to be trusted to, to tell a story that that oh that lovely was just just remarkable to be able to work with some of like some of the best in in prison and to be able to pull them together and sort of call up and go you know hi i'm lauren i want to bring you on this job oh great you know and you treated as i guess you'd say any other producer rather than you know i felt like i was this little like uni student being like can i play (laughs) um disney remarkable drama queens um drama queens was so fun they were so humble and, you know, they were like, we've got this, this little show and we play some drums and then you watch it and you're like, this is unbelievable. I can't believe I get to film this. And like, I just wanted to tell everybody that I knew, like, go and see this show. Um, you know, so to be able to work directly with those guys, I think sometimes in these big projects, it's like you talk to them, you talk to them, you talk to them, to, you know, and there's this one of the bigger clients that I have at the moment, there's like six people that I have to communicate through to get to the person that answers my question. And, and, you know, there's drama queen didn't have that. It was like, hi, I'm the director. You shake, you know, as in the director of the show and, and you get to shake his hand and, you know, he's like, here's my phone number. And you're like, what is happening? Like, <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> it's 
come a long way from the girl that was told uh, uh, no for acting, hasn't it? But, uh, I, know, I mean, the first, the very first thing we ever filmed at l l was a coffee shop down near my house. I said to him, we want to have business meetings and we can't afford to buy these people coffee. But there's this moment at the end of every meeting where somebody pays the bill and it's a power play, right? You know, does the client pay the bill or do you, you know? And I, and I said to him, if you, I'll do you video if you give me a, a, a ticket of coffees that I, so I just go, oh, it's sticking on our tab. And he was like, absolutely. So he did like Friday, no, Saturday morning events. I went down and I filmed the events with DJs and coffee and just people having fun. And so I just, you know, I just filmed this little reel for them and they put it all over their Facebook page and he paid me in 50 cups of coffee. So every time I had a business meeting, I would take them to this coffee shop, uh, which sadly he's, he's moved on to other things now. It's not open anymore. But we would sit down at this the, this table that was kind of like my table and, and, you know, we'd talk about their idea and then at the end I'd be thank you so much for your time. You know, when it's that moment, I go, coffee's on us. I would just, I would look at him and be like, you, you know, and he'd give me a little wink and like, just, you know, those funny little things where you think that's, that was the first one. And now, you know, we've just, we just had the opportunity to make some beautiful stuff. <laughs> See, that's magic. And that's good hustle too. You know, that's good. <laughs> but, you know, if your film students are listening to this and they, they should be, that's the sort of hustle it takes mm -hmm. because nobody's going to give it to you. And I, I really do think that that is a, a misconception that people do, oh, they, they look at their own work and they, uh, you know, might be very pleased with what they produce. But once you get out the other side, nobody cares. Um, yeah. And yeah. you have got to work. And yeah. you have got to come up with very creative solutions, particularly when you're starting from scratch mm -hmm. for sweet little moves like that, you know, like <laughs> the coffee shop hustle. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a cracker. That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, too, if you, if you treat every single job, like I just I really don't believe that the excuse should ever be, oh, we had a very small budget. Um, now, I am absolutely not saying work for free. And I'm absolutely not saying that you should, like, spend all of your money and, and hire the most epic cameras for every shoot. That's, that's not what this is about. Put your best foot forward. Create an idea that fits in that budget scope. But like you said, think of a creative solution that makes it entertaining or interesting or beautiful in a way that doesn't cost an enormous amount of money. Don't dream big and then do an average job because you didn't have the budget to sustain your idea. Um, but, you know, if the budget's small, create a, a sweet, little, heartfelt, easy to make, easy to contain story and then do the best job that you can because somebody is going to see that and go, gee, that's, that's well made. And then it's, for me, it was all word of mouth. Like somebody would see something that I'd made or talk to somebody who I'd work with or a, the, a very common one is, you know, Wendy from this company asks Jenny from that company who did their videos. And Jenny's like, oh, I'll go see the girls at, at Tide, you know. Well, and, and and that it was snowball. Whereas if you, oh, that's such a small budget. I don't really know what we can do. We'll do a talking head. And I guess that's all you can have. If that's boring and then, you know, Wendy's unsatisfied, she's not going to recommend you to Jenny. This an analogy is getting weird. But you know what I mean? <laughs> do the absolute best that you can with what you've got. Dream an appropriate size, but put all your energy into it. And then, and then it'll snowball and people will start to trust you with more and more bigger and better ideas until eventually somebody does a blurb about you and says that you work for Disney. <laughs> and that, but I mean, that's exactly how it starts. And I mean, that story, you know, anyone you speak to that's done things in this industry, you know, it's the same. You have got to grind it out and you've got to earn a place. And, you know, you do that by turning up, you know, with no ego and yeah. just – loving your job and not getting too, too obsessed about the camera package and, you know, because I also see that a lot where they're like, oh, well, you need to shoot this on the left <laughs> with uh, anamorphics, but then we have no budget for sound or lighting. But, you know, we've got the camera, that will carry us through. And you're like, mate, it won't. You actually would have been better to shoot it on your mobile phone and then, like, get the dudes with the best group truck in Brisbane. <laughs> uh, light it for you and then shoot it with your phone and it'll actually and you know good soundy there so it looks and sounds and it'll actually probably be a better piece of work um than you know your your big camera with anamorphics on it that you know is with no sound and and terrible light 
And I, I honestly don't think that that's something that that gets through enough. And, you know, when you talk about, you know, responsible allocation of budget to go, how can we squeeze this to, again, make something beautiful, mm. that being the end goal. And, and, and the other thing I think to not lose sight of is what's the story that you need to tell? Because you might have this, and I've, it's happened to me before, I've had this massive idea of all this sort of stuff and then you distill it down to the, the core of the idea and you realise you're actually telling a story of your own ego, you're not telling a story that suits the business. And so you strip it all the way back down and you go, okay, we need to start from start from the bottom. What is the story? How do we tell it properly? Because uh, sometimes you can get, you know, you can get too creative. Someone very wise, it honestly may have been you, someone very wise told me, and I've carried this with me through my whole career, just you keep, <laughs> I think if, if it was you, you would have said hustling. You just keep hustling and then eventually you'll look around and everybody around you that you were competing with, something's come up and they've moved and then you're still standing. And I found that really true for my situation. So I graduated with, you know, well, I don't know, 120 other people who all wanted jobs and I, you know, there were just people everywhere and then I just kept on going and then, you know, blah, blah, went and worked in an agency and yada, yada, went and studied teaching and this person over here did something else and, it wasn't at all that those people were failing and I'm succeeding. It was just that everybody's going in different directions. And if you follow your vision of where you want to be, eventually you'll be standing there. Whereas I think it would, I am easily destructible. Uh, I definitely would have sort of, you know, gone off and followed something shiny by accident. Whereas it was you or Dean Moore. Yeah. Said that to me. And I just, when I get really overwhelmed or I feel like I'm competing in this world where there are just too many other people playing, I just stop and I go just focus on this one project, just get this out, just do your job, head down, and then when you stand up again, it'll be a different landscape, and it is every time. I do hope your students actually watch this. Um, <laughs> because, <will>. yeah, <laughs> but, but, you know, there's there's some real gems in here in terms of, like, that that lived experience and an appreciation, and it's one of my favourite things about, you know, this industry is – that you will not last, like if you don't love it, like if you don't love it with every ounce of your being, Absolutely. like, mate, you will not make it. This, or this if you do, you'll be really miserable and you'll be that person, that client that everyone hates working with because you're so miserable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you know, unfortunately you do come across those and I, you know, Came across a few of those in broadcast in particular where, you know, I and I could never understand that. They, I'm like, mate, you're shooting for a living. Like, why do you hate it so much? Like, you're not supposed – like, look at what you get to do. This is awesome. And yeah. and I've always found that to be deeply sad. And I've sort of always said to myself, like, if, if there comes a day that I don't enjoy it, I'll stop doing it. Mm. But I don't know about you, but I, I love it more than I ever have before. Same. And and it's it's the it's the capacity each time somebody reaches out to you and goes, Oh, hey, I've got this this thing. Could could you have a look at it? And then that cumulative experience that you've got behind you and that beautiful network of wonderful humans that you've done, you know, crazy stuff with. And as you said, you go, Oh, I know exactly. I know exactly. You can see in your head, like you can imagine the story, you can see the pictures, and you're like, I know exactly who I need to bring this to life. I, I don't know. There's something really magical about that. I agree. Yeah. Oh, Lauren, this has actually really been a lot of fun. Um, is is there anything that you'd for for somebody that perhaps wanted to be a producer, wanted to run their own production company? We we've covered a lot of it. What what would your advice be to them? Uh, one of the really valuable things I found while I was learning was mentorship. Find somebody that you trust, you know, and, and don't cling to them like a lifeboat. I think I did that a couple of times with some mentors. Like it was like, if I don't have you, my business won't survive. That's not what it's about. It's about finding somebody who you can bring questions um, to as you're learning and a really safe environment where you can be like, this is happening. Like I've sent this pitch and I've come back with this and I don't know what to do. Or I've sent this quote and it's been six months and now they want the same price. How do I handle it? Like those little things, um, when you make those mistakes, like if, if you handle that incorrectly, you lose a client, which, which, which blows. Um, but if you could just brainstorm off somebody who's like, no, 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 you've got this. Um, 
you know, a, a student called me recently and they said, you know, I've, I've pitched this idea um, and they've come back and they've said they only have, so let's, I'll put some fake numbers in for the story. Uh, you know, I pitched three grand and they've come back and they've said they only have two. Do I just email back and say, yeah, okay. Absolutely not. No, no. You redefine the idea. Take away a camera. Figure out a way to make it too grand for you. Like re redesign the story so that it fits inside this new budget and then say to them, happy to do it for two. This is what you will get instead, or this is what the sacrifice of that thousand dollars represents inside our story. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, great. Um, so now the client understands that he, you know, because one of the biggest things I did when I was first starting is, you know, you'd say one thousand, they'd say five hundred, you'd say, okay. And then the next time you'd say 500, they'd say 300, you'd say, okay. And they just realized that you were free uh, because re in your own head, you were everything that was being like every dollar was like, was profit because it's your own business. Just, that is not accurate. <laughs> you know, so that those having a mentor to sort of workshop that kind of stuff with you was, was, was great. Um, I had some amazing ones. Uh, I still do. I have people in my life that I can see mentors now. Um, so that would be a big, big tip that I would say is, is find somebody they trust or some people they trust and just have somewhere safe to ask those questions. Um, yeah. And Lauren, if people want to follow your magical adventures around the internet, where can they find you? Uh, Instagram, Facebook. I think we're on Facebook. I'm not very, uh, where else? LinkedIn. I have the LinkedIn's. I am on the Facebook. <laughs> Well, I'll Does tell that you what. Your question? Web, my website. Uh, yeah, mate. Share because what I or what I'll do is I'll share those um, in in the links underneath the show from today. Great. Um, so they can, <laughs> can track you down, and if they enjoy what you said, um, they they could reach out to you at least three times. Um, right. And, and say, get a load. Um, because do not start the email with who are me, to who are me concerned. <laughs> Actually, you do, I, I'm. Actually, in future, I'm going to email you to whom it may concern. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lauren, I, I really appreciate your time coming and chatting with me today. It it has been really lovely, and you know, it's so did I. Too. I was expecting. It's surprising. Look, I I heard a couple of noises because. Um, <laughs> You know, not not only does Lauren have all those things, but she's also, you know, a working mother. I have um, a very cute sixteen month year old who is not okay with my office door being shut. <laughs> no, no, would be very upset because uh, you know that that assistant producer there might uh, wants wants a say on everything that's going to be uh, going to be done. Um, Lauren, thank you for your time today. It, it has been a real pleasure to have you here. Um, and, yeah, as I said, I'll, I'll share all the details where people can find you. Um, Thanks. Thanks for I can follow you, follow your next adventure. Amazing. You're great. This is, this is great. You're good at this. Uh, <laughs> see, I told you, not scary at all. It's not scary, scary at all. But, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, until next time. <laughs> okay. See you later. Do I get outro music? Do I have oh, waves? Right. Please. No, I, you, Wait, Can I roll? <laughs>